Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Dima Abdelhadi. I'm coming to you from Mississauga, Ontario in Canada. I'd like to welcome you to um, the Cancer Screening and Primary Care. Um, and I'm hopeful that this will be a useful lecture. So first of all, I'd like to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about my background. I'm actually a family doctor based in Mississauga, Ontario. I do lecture with the University of Toronto in Ontario and I teach medical students there. I also am affiliated with Trillium Health Partners um, and Credit Valley Hospital. I also sat on the Cancer Care Network as a representative from 2015 to 2017 um, for the Mississauga Halton Local Health Network. Just a few things I'd, uh, for disclosure that I'd like um, to mention is that I did sit on the Western Ontario Advisory Board meeting with SI Limited for Lemberg-Sant. It has no affiliation with this lecture at all. And also, all the information and data presented will be from Ontario, Canada, Cancer Care Ontario guidelines, with permission. So this may not necessarily apply to the region that you're in, and you would want to address the specific guidelines in the region that you are presently working at. So the three main things that we want to hit today during our lecture is that we want to discuss screening, what is screening, the purpose of screening. We're going to review the guidelines for the three main cancer screening uh, available in Ontario and just a few special mentions to discuss. So first of all, what makes a good screening program? So when we're discussing screening, we want to think about the features of the disease, which would be, is there a significant impact on public health? Is there an asymptomatic period where the patient may have the disease but de and detection is still possible? And will the outcomes be improved by treatment during the asymptomatic period? We want to consider features of the test. So is it sensitive? i.e. what's the ability of the test to correctly identify patients with the disease and what's the specificity of the test? Is the ability of the test to correctly identify people without the disease? And we want to make sure that the screening test that we're using is acceptable to patients. We also want to consider the screen population themselves. So we want to make sure that there's a sufficiently high prevalence of the disease to justify us doing the screening in the first place. We want to make sure once the screen has done, if there is an abnormality, that patients can access relevant medical care and it's accessible. And finally, we want to make sure that patients are actually willing to comply with the further follow-up um, workup or treatment. So in Ontario, there are three major screening pop, um, programs that exist. There is cervical cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer screening. So the reasons that we have these screening is because the incidence, um, the age standardized incidence rate, and this data is from 2016, which is the most up-to-date data from the Cancer Care Report, Ontario report that was released uh, this year, for all cancers combined was 502 excuse me, 504,000 new cases per 100,000 people. So in 2016, the age standardized incidence rate for breast cancer was 129 new cases per 100,000 women. For colorectal cancer, it was 52 new cases per 100,000 um, people. And for cervical cancer, it was 8.2 new cases per 100,000 women. Except for cervical cancer, the incidence rate actually increases with age and was highest in people for age 80 and over. So for cervical cancer, the incidence rate was actually ages, highest in ages 40 to 59. So since 1992, the age standard is standardized incidence rate of female breast cancers in Ontario has been steadily decreasing. The, S the ASIR for colorectal cancer for men and women combined decreased between 2008 and 2016, and cervical in cancer incidence also decreased from 1981 to 2016. There was also a decrease in mortality rates um, uh, for uh, female breast cancers and uh, colorectal cancers and cervical cancers overall. And this was thought to be due to the introduction of the screening. Now, 
there are different screening programs available. And how are these developed is that first guidelines are created. So a guideline development network um, will develop the guideline. It'll include multidisciplinary panel of clinicians, contact experts, and they define practice questions, identify and appraise all relevant evidence and literature, and they reach a consensus to create draft recommendations. Once those draft recommendations are developed, they are brought back to stakeholders who will then take a look at the data and take a look and um, uh, release the updated feedback and guidelines together um, for the general population uh, or general uh, population of physicians, excuse me, to use. Now, these guidelines allow for a uniform method of dealing with screening, but of course, clinical judgment and patient history must be considered at all times when making these recommendations. So when developing these screening programs, the recommendations of the International Agency for Research on Cancer um, are taken into consideration. And uh, the Ontario's organized cancer screening programs have developed the following features to be able to qualify them as a good program. So it needs explicit screening policies with specific age criteria, methods and in screening intervals, i.e. who to initiate screening on, when to initiate the screening and when to end the screening. You need a defined target population. You need a management team responsible for implementation of the screening program a health team responsible for decision-making and care, quality assurance structure, and finally a method for identifying cancer. So what method are we using? Are we using PAPs? Um, are we using mammographies, ultrasounds, MRIs, etc.? So, and then finally, implementation of the program. So for implementation of the programs, we need to have a method to I invite the people to participate. So the cancer screening programs here have a letter that actually goes out to patients and it does have the physician name um, that they are affiliated with if they have a family doctor for a more personal approach, approach to let them know that they are due for their screening. Once the screening has been done and results are available, they'll be sent another letter to let them know that your test results were normal or your test results need further follow-up. Um, the programs also allow for tracking participants throughout the screening and diagnosis process. Um, it can help participants coordinate their next steps in their screening process if need be. For example, high-risk Ontario breast screening program may help direct people for genetic assessments. And then finally, the, breast, the cancer screening program may, must be able to measure their um, quality and performance. So when we're talking about... Um, screening, we also have to understand there are limitations to screening. So sometimes there may be screening that may miss cancers. For example, uh, a ma 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 mammogram was done and it was um, read as normal, but unfortunately it actually missed that there was a um, abnormality and it was, it was labeled as a false negative. Sometimes um, you may have scenarios where cancer develops in between the screening um, timeline. So a patient had a mammogram uh, six months ago, they have since developed breast cancer. Their next one won't be due for another year and a half, and they don't necessarily have symptoms, so they won't know that they have that, and it may miss that. Um, and then sometimes people with abnormal screening results may actually not necessarily have a cancer or abnormalities that could develop into cancer, but the test flag is positive, and that's known as a false positive. For example, for every 200 women screened in the Ontario Breast Screening Program, about 17 or 18 women are then referred on for further tests, and only one of them will actually end up having breast cancer. That obviously causes a lot of anxiety for patients. It's a little bit nerve-wracking to be waiting for test results, waiting for the next step. Um, and then we have to consider there are harms of actual further testing for some patients. So, for example, diagnostic tests may actually cause harm when the patient didn't actually have a disease to begin with, they may be one of those people who had a false positive and then they ended up having either a colonoscopy perforation or they had um, difficulty from pregnancy after many colposcopies. So the other things to consider is when we do the test, sometimes that we may find something that we don't have an option to treat. So if you remember when I talked about the features of a good screening test, we'd have to consider that they have to have an option to be able to be treated. And sometimes cancers are found that are not 
able to be treated. And then some cancers may actually never need to be treated and we're giving a patient a diagnosis and the anxiety associated with that diagnosis, but actually that cancer may never come to harm them or be life-threatening in anything. Now, we're going to move on to the specific types of cancer programs that we do have in Ontario. So cervical cancer um, accounts for about 2% of all new cancer cases in women. The incidence rate of cervical cancer have steadily decreased over the past several decades, and this is likely due to the implementation of the PAP test um, for detecting the pre-invasive lesions. Currently in Ontario, the guidelines still use the um, cytology-based Paplinico smear. However, we will be changing this in the fairly near future. The exact timeline is still to be determined, and um, it will be more based on HPV results rather than um, the cytology-based approach. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the cytology-based approach because that's what's actually still in in um, in use in Ontario. Now, uh, the main risk factors, of course, for developing cervical cancer is exposure to HPV. However, other risk factors that you may want to consider um, uh, when you're counseling a patient would be um, becoming sexually active at a young age, having multiple partners, um, whether it's, you know, multiple marriages or uh, other relations, um, smoking, immunosuppression, um, using birth control for extended periods of time, or having been exposed to DES or being the daughter of a mother who had exposure to DES. Now, this algorithm actually um, is fairly straightforward, but when we're considering initiation of pap smears, um, the recommendation is to start at age of 25, this is actually a fairly new change in the guidelines. The guidelines up until very recently were to start at age 21 from sexual activity, meaning um, if somebody has never been sexually active, and sexually active can be defined as um, any form of sexual contact, either through penetration, uh, through fingers, or through oral, that would be considered sexual contact. However, um, culture um, and background of the person maybe need to consider whether you're going to be initiating the pap smear um, at that point. Um, so th the age now recently has been changed to age 25 um, if they have been sexually active. Depending on their results, if they are normal, and I'll talk about abnormal shortly, but if they're normal, they would then need to proceed with cytology every three years if the screening test is negative with a cessation at age 70 as long as if you've had three normal pap smears within the past 10 years. Now, this pathway is a little bit more elaborate in that what happens when somebody has an abnormality. So, and it all depends on what grade of the cytology spectrum they are, what grade of abnormality, I should say. So, first of all, we would say um, if they are normal, then they would return to normal uh, screening every three years. If there is any other form of abnormality, and depending on the grade grading system, so atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, low-grade squamous um, ELSO, low-grade lesions or high-grade lesions, then you would either repeat the cytology in six months, and if um, it was ASCUS and it was a normal repeat, you would once again repeat it, and then if it still continues to be normal, then return to cytology screening every three years. If they do have an abnormality after the first ASCUS, you would then refer on to colposcopy at any point down the algorithm. For LCIL, if they do have any abnormalities, you could consider repeating um, in six months versus sending straight on to colposcopy. And of course, if there's any high-grade lesion, you would then go ahead and refer on to colposcopy. These new guidelines may consider um, testing for HPV um, if there's an abnormality at ASCUS. Um, and if it's HPV negative, you may actually not need to follow, continue repeating the cytology, but that would be um, dependent on the patient's ability to pay for the HPV testing. So after the colposcopy has been done and they've been discharged, because 
uh, once they've gotten to the colposcopy, you've now referred them on for specialist care. And, and let's say they were either um, not diagnosed with cancer or um, they would had a LEAP procedure and they didn't need to be followed anymore by the specialist, they would then be discharged back to the primary care physician. And depending on the grading of where they're at, you would return to screening um, based on the algorithm. If you have their um, uh, HPV test was negative um, for the high risk HPV that could potentially cause cervical cancers like eight, 16 or 18, um, then you would just return to three years screening. If they are HPV positive, but they have been discharged, it would be annual screening. And if you don't know their HPV status, um, if they are normal, you could you would be able to go for every three years. If they had any gradient of abnormality, you would then need to be annual screening. Moving on to breast cancer. So breast cancer is actually the third most common cancer in Canada, and it's the number one cancer diagnosed in women. About one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. 83% of the diagnosis will be occur in women above age 50. Risk factors would include age, family history, if they have any genetic mutations in the BRCA gene, their reproductive spat, uh, status, so if they, for example, went through menopause at a late uh, stage, or if they had any exogenous estrogen exposures, and then of course things like alcohol or obesity. So 70% of breast cancers with the new screening program will be caught um, or be diagnosed, excuse me, I should say at an early stage, which is stage two or three. And 88% of the women actually diagnosed with breast cancer um, have a five-year survival rate, um, uh, which 88% uh, of them will actually have survive at five years or more. Um, when we're looking at the breast cancer screening program, we're looking at um, who are we screening. So Average risk women would include um, women who have no breast cancer symptoms. So that's very important to note that when you're doing a screening program, the patient has no symptoms. If they come to you and tell you, I have a lump, that is no longer screening. That is actually diagnostic, and we're not following this algorithm. And that applies for a cervical cancer, colon cancer, or a breast cancer. Um, a screening. So they have no breast cancer symptoms. They have no personal history of breast cancer. They have no current implants, um, have not had a mastectomy, and um, have not had a screening mammogram within the last 11 months. This is not to say that women who have ma um, implants cannot do mammograms, but rather that they are not eligible for this program. Um, so when um, the mammogram is done, um, and if it's normal, they would then be recalled every two year. However, there are indications for women to be recalled at the one year mark if they have any documented pathology of high risk lesions, if they have a personal history of ovarian cancer, if they have two or more first degree relatives with breast cancer at any age, if they have a first degree relative with breast cancer under age four, uh, 50, or a first degree relative with ovarian cancer at any age, or if they have a male relative with breast cancer, of course, that puts them at an increased risk. And then, of course, things like breast density um, would need to be considered. And if it's above age, uh, excuse me, above 75% uh, dense, then you would want to consider having annual recalls or if the radiologist themselves are recommending it. Um, there is the high risk program. So um, the high risk program it would include um, MRIs as well as mammogram. And if somebody's not eligible for an MRI, they would then do an ultrasound. So if they are high risk um, and uh, who would be included in the high risk uh, strat strategies is that if somebody has a known genetic mutation, for example, BRCA1 or BRCA2, if they are first degree relatives of somebody with a um, known mutation, but they have elected not to be tested or we don't have test results. Um, or if they've been assessed by a genetics clinic and using a calculator for assessment, um, like the IBIS or the Bodicia tools have rec said that they are above 25% risk of developing it, then um, based on their personal family history, then they would be eligible for the high risk program. Or if they've had radiation therapy to the chest um, to treat a different cancer,
um, before age 30 and at least eight years have passed since that time, they would also be eligible for the high risk program. Of course, at any point where if there's an abnormality in the screening, they then get um, a, transferred on to the specialist, for example, the surgeon, or we have programs like the diagnostic assessment program where they get rapid access for further assessment, um, biopsies if needed, and surgeries, and then meeting with the um, uh, teams associated with cancer if need be, like an oncologist or, rad um, or radiotherapy. Now, colon cancer is actually the second most common cancer in Canada. One in 14 men will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer in their lifetime, and one in 18 women will be diagnosed with um, colorectal cancer in their lifetime. 93% of colorectal cancers occur in adults above age 50. There's two different types of methods for screening. Um, I'm going to talk about the FIT one first, and then we'll talk a little bit about colonoscopies. Um, risk factors, of course, for colorectal cancer is age, physical inactivity, smoking, heavy drinking, being overweight or obesity, a diet high in processed meat or red meats, a, a family history, or history of colorectal polyps or inflammatory bowel disease in the patient. 39% of colorectal cancer cases are diagnosed early in development at stage one and two through, these, um, through the screening program, and 65% of the Canadians diagnosed with colorectal cancer survive five or more years. So the FIT testing is the fecal immunochemical test has an overall high diagnostic accuracy for detecting colorectal cancer. Um, if you take a look at the PowerPoint, you'll actually see um, the little image there. It's a very simple stool test. Um, the patient, um, the family doctor will send off the requisition to the lab. The lab will then mail the patient the kit. It doesn't have the same um, limitations that the previous fecal to cold blood test did um, with dietary or medication limitations. So it's much easier to take. It's actually only one test that needs to be done. And it targets the hemoglobin in the lower GI tract as the hemoglobin from the upper GI tract will be degraded when it arrives into the lower GI tract. This characteristic allows the FIT test to be um, to specifically detect bleeding from the lower GI and therefore detect the disease with bleeding such as adenomas, polyps, inflammatory diseases, and of course colorectal cancer. Um, so they would then take a sample from their stool, they would um, put it back in, slip it back in, in a prepackaged um, uh, labeled con uh, like a letter and then mail it back to Cancer Care Ontario. All of this is actually all covered so they don't have to worry about cost or postage or anything like that. Everything is provided and then they would receive a result, um, uh, hopefully that it's normal and it, um, if it's normal, FIT tests do have an 82% sensitivity and a 93% specificity. So it's it's a fairly reliable test. Of course, it's not 100%. Um, patients, however, may consider um, screening through colonoscopies. And uh, the reason that we would want to do that is if somebody has an increased risk. So it, that would include things we talked about, like familial history. Um, and if that's the case, a colonoscopy would be the gold standard. You'd um, recommend doing that. If somebody had a normal FIT test um, two years ago, you would be repeating it again in two years. If they develop symptoms, they are no longer screening and those that's symptomatic. You need to um, proceed that way. But if somebody had a colonoscopy, that would be considered, unless the, um, the specialist has recommended a different time frame, that would be considered good for 10 years. You don't need to do FIT testing within those 10 years. You would then resume after 10 years after the colonoscopy, provided obviously that um, they haven't had a family history change, for example, and obviously they don't have any symptoms. Um, so who would you consider above average risk? You would say somebody who had before uh, a family history of uh, colon cancers, um, or if there's a hereditary syndrome like Lynch syndrome, for example, you would also want to consider res uh, referring them on to genetic assessment. Um, and things to remember when you're doing screening is you start, if there is a family history, 10 years before the family member was affected. So for example, we said age 50 um, in, to start screening, but 
we would stop screen, uh, excuse me, we would start screening earlier in somebody who had um, a, a family member diagnosed at age 47, well, then you would consider starting to screen them at age 37, which is considerably lower than the age 50. Um, and then if we said mentioned already, don't use fit for symptomatic patients. And um, even if, for example, they have a history of uh, hemorrhoids and it's rectal bleeding, well, they're still symptomatic. Can you be 100% sure that bleeding is just from the hemorrhoids? No. So then you would want to recommend a colonoscopy rather than a fit test. And then for all patients, it is not recommended to do things like um, blood or urine tests. There's lots of different tests um, that are, um, you know, advertised by labs. Um, CT colonas, there's capsule colonoscopies, barium enemas. At this time, they are not recommended for screening. So this is kind of like an outline of who to screen, when to screen. During COVID, um, you do have to keep in mind per, um, whether it's appropriate to be bringing patients in for otherwise not really medically, quote unquote, necessary procedures, but rather preventative procedures. You would want to um, consider uh, what PPE, so personal protective equipment, do you have to protect yourself in this time? Um, what's the staffing, the physical space look like to be able to uh, allow for social distancing as much as possible? Um, there was a stage in time where when COVID first started that Cancer Care Ontario actually recommended to stop doing pap smears, um, the fit testing and mammograms because patients were not able to access the next steps if need be because of the reduction in services. It has, however, resumed um, in the past few months and it I am able now to get out the fit testing to patients, but as well if there's an abnormality, get them to the um, get them to the uh, colonoscopy if needed. Um, and then this would all of course you you need to consider your own areas what they are able to do so when do you stop screening so um for cervical cancer i think it's above at age 70 as long as they've had three or more normal cytology um for colorectal cancers it's um age 75 and under so 74 um you'd need to just consider would you need to stop if somebody had, was a high risk individual and then for mammograms also we would stop at age 74 but of course if after talking to your patient and you want to continue screening because of personal circumstances, then that would be consideration to go off of the program, but rather be um, sending them for mammograms um, as a as a their family doctor rather than them being combined as part of the program. So just a few special mentions. Um, there are other cancers, of course, that you can screen for, um, but they're not they don't have programs in Ontario. The reason being is that, one, they still haven't been um, piloted um, or haven't been developed well enough to have them as a major cancer screening program. Um, for example, there is a pilot program initiated in 2017 by Cancer Care Ontario, but it's only available at certain sites. Not everywhere has access to it. It's a low-dose CT scan for high-risk patients. Um, for example, somebody who's smoked a significant 30-pack year, but age above 55. And then um, they, the, another criteria could be that they've smoked cigarettes for at least every day for at least 20 years. They don't have to be consecutive 20 years. And then they're between the ages of 55 to 74. Um, prostate cancer screening actually is not recommended um, as a screening, for, as an overall program. It's an individual discussion that you would have with your patient based on their personal um, risk factors and their perf personal preference. Um, so the, given the potential harms of screening, including overdiagnosis and over-treatment, um, Cancer Care Ontario does not support an organized population-based screening program. Men who are concerned about their risk for prostate cancer should talk to their primary care provider. And there is a decision grid actually on their website, Cancer Care Ontario's website, where you can go through the pros and cons of the PSA testing um, to be able to see if it's if it's something that they want to proceed with. So um, just as an example, if we go to the 
grid, it it's quite thorough. You'll be able to go step by step with the questions and say, what do I do if my PSA level is high? Um, does it mean I have prostate cancer? And the reason that this really isn't a program is that lots of people may have high PSAs and it doesn't um, actually mean cancer. Lots of people will have normal PSAs and they actually will have cancer. And that's the reasoning that it's not developed into a program for the province, but a patient can go through this to understand their risks. Um, and then just finally, I'd like to mention some resources that patients can access for themselves. Um, unfortunately, Cancer Care Ontario didn't have any handouts in Arabic, um, but the American Cancer Society did have some handouts. So I've just attached that link over here. You can go through it together. It will talk to you about um, screening tests, what are the screening tests, and they've mentioned cervical, colorectal, and mammogram as well. So that may be a useful resource. Um, this is straight off from the website for um, from the American Cancer Society. And then um, another useful resource, it is however in English, unfortunately I uh, don't have um, it in Arabic, but um, some patients may be able to access it, is My Cancer IQ. And it's from the cool, um, from Cancer Care Ontario's website as well. What it does is you can enter your um, specific information for each person individually, and they can include um, their own risk factors. And it'll give you, are you at average risk or are you above average risk based on the information you've entered? So it does have actually more than the regular, um, or not regular, excuse me, more than the three cancers I've talked about but uh, breast cancer, cervical, colorectal, kidney, lung, and melanomas. And uh, somebody would just enter their information. You have to consent, go through the, um, uh, go through the questionnaires. It'll ask you about you know, specific questions, your risk factors, and then at the end, they'll give you, are you average or above average? And then if you are above average, you may need to talk to your doctor about what can you do to mitigate that risk and what can you do to... Um, uh, what is there any screening options available so i'd like to thank you for attending thank you for joining us